Really great to be with you for our midweek service here, friends, um, going through the uh, book of Isaiah. It's a teaching time. We've got a great opportunity to uh, um, study Isaiah 48, God's training through discipline. We get into some of the most wonderful, most, some of the most magnificent chapters in the whole of the Bible. Not quite there yet, but just getting there now. Just all these prophecies about the coming Messiah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for one another now. Father, we just thank you that we can come aside this evening, Lord, right where we are, right even in our homes. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, we can meet with you. Father, however we're feeling, Lord, there'll be some, Lord, that are watching this who, Lord, are on top of the world, Lord, and maybe some, Lord, who are going through deep difficulties. And Father, we just pray for your blessing. We pray for peace. And Father, we pray for joy, Lord, even as we go through difficult circumstances. But really encourage us today, Lord. May we see, Lord, um, Lord, something of hope, something of uh, great uh, salvation and hope, Lord, uh, through your word as we go through Isaiah. And we ask your blessing on us now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, hello, friends. It's good to be here again. It's good to be in the book of Isaiah again. And our prayer is just that the Lord is um, speaking to you and blessing you through this teaching. It's not so much about what we say. It's about what he is saying. That's what we really want to hear about, isn't it? Um, and so we've called this one God's Training Through Discipline. And this chapter completes God's predictions through Isaiah of his future plan to send Cyrus to deliver the Jews from Babylon and to re-establish them in their homeland. If you remember this section of eight chapters from chapter 40, when Isaiah's prophecies sort of turned a corner from more judgment to more hope, through to this chapter 48, um, were called Announcement of Hope in the summary. And um, it was the hope of a deliverer who was going to come to Babylon and release the captive Israelites and allow them to go back to Jerusalem and restore the city, restore the temple and um, everything that that meant to them. But Isaiah really in this chapter is posing a question to his readers. What spiritual condition will God's people be in when they go back to Israel? And verse 1 of chapter 48 declares that, uh, um, that the nation has forfeited the right to be called Israel. And the final verse of the chapter, verse 22, says there is no peace for the wicked. And between these two brackets, Isaiah is really exposing the spiritual needs of the Jewish nation as they go back to Jerusalem. He's showing that at heart they've still got the same problems with sin after the exile that they had before it. But it's preparing the way to begin showing what the work of Messiah is going to be. And that's going to be the focus of the following chapters, 49 through to 55. But before we get there, we're going to study this chapter 48, where God explains his purpose for Israel's exile in Babylon. There's greater detail on why he allowed it, what he was trying to achieve by it. We've already seen that they were exiled because they were idolaters, because they were faithless, because they didn't follow God's ways. And so he allowed the Babylonians to come and take them away. But his discipline wasn't just punishment, it was also a training ground for them. So let's read the first um, few verses of this chapter. Isaiah 48 verse 1, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are named Israel, and who came forth from the loins of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city and lean on the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. I declared the former things long ago and they went forth from my mouth and I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted and they came to pass. Because I know that you're obstinate and your neck is an iron sinew and your forehead bronze. Therefore I declared them to you long ago. Before they took place I proclaimed them to you so that you would not say my idol has done them, and my graven image and my molded image have commanded them. I'm just going to pause there. It's quite a, it's hard to know where to stop in this chapter. But in verse 1, God's really saying that Israel are a nation of people who can walk, talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. He says, 
O house of Jacob, who are named Israel, and who came forth from the loins of Judah, your mostly descendants of Judah, you swear by my name and you invoke me. And I looked up invoke because I wasn't 100% sure of the meaning. And it's to call upon earnestly or solemnly to implore assistance to address in prayer. So they're praying to God. They're invoking his name. They're swearing in his name, God says, but not in truth nor in righteousness. What a condemnation. It's hypocrisy. It's play acting. It's saying the right words but not living the right life. They were happy to take God's name without taking his nature. So God's really um, condemning his people. He's saying this is what you are. You should be one way but you're another. And most of the people were his in name only. And this is a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Do we always live in a way that lives up to what we're saying is our profession of faith only so deep? Or do we allow God to work right through to our hearts and deal with our sin? And as we go on, God says they call themselves after the holy city. So they're talking about Jerusalem and saying, you know, it's our home. It's where we belong, even though we're far away. And they say they're leaning on me, but they're not. And in verse three, I declared the former things long ago. They went forth from my mouth and I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted and they came to pass. So God's saying he uses prophecy to show that he's responsible for an event. He prophesied all the things that we've already read about in Isaiah's lifetime, that the Assyrians would conquer Israel, the northern kingdom, and take them off. He prophesied that Hezekiah and Jerusalem would be delivered from the Assyrians. He would protect Jerusalem. And the people had seen all these things come true, the people who were alive when Isaiah was speaking and writing these prophecies. But it's also showing the the Jews who would come in future, the ones who would be exiled in Babylon. I declared those things as well. I declared that you'd be taken to Babylon. I declare, and I'm declaring now that Cyrus will come and let you out. These prophecies are just as trustworthy. God speaks and then the event happens. So this is pointing to an eternal and powerful God outside of time. And we've said this several times over the last few weeks. But then he says, suddenly I acted and they came to pass. You know, the fulfillment of God's words can seem slow in coming. God may have promised you something and you're just wondering, well, when is that going to happen? I'm really longing to see this promise come true that God's made to me. But, you know, it can be a long time, but then God acts quickly when the time is right. And uh, we get a sense of this in the book of Peter, in the letter that Peter wrote to Peter 3, 9. I was reminded of this when I was reading Isaiah. And Peter says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And I love this verse. This is God's heart. It was his heart for the Jews then. It's his heart for us now. If he seems slow, it's because he's waiting for things to happen in the meantime. But one day, when the time is right, Everything God has said is going to come to pass. He will act quickly. But then the next few verses paint a really hard picture of how the Jews had been. Um, Last week when we were studying chapters 46 and 47, God described his people as rebellious and stubborn. And here he does so again. And Let's read verse 4. Because I know that you're obstinate, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead bronze. What a way to describe his people. God's saying, it's like you're made of metal, and these particular metals, iron and bronze, I mean, if you ever banged into a cast iron gate or a frying pan, you know, they're hard. They're much harder than gold, for instance, which is soft and malleable. No, iron and bronze are very, very hard. And God's saying, that's what you're like. You're hard towards me. You're hard-hearted. Your necks are hard. You won't turn. Um, But I don't want you to be hard. And we'll come back to that in a minute as we go on. 
verse 5 says, Therefore, because you were hard, because you were hard-hearted and stubborn, I declared things to you long ago. This is the former things that we were mentioned in verse 3. Before they took place, I proclaimed them to you so that you would not say my idol has done them. What a revelation this is. God saying, I've told you things in advance so that you can't attribute events to your false gods, to your idols. I'm much greater than I am, than they are. All through the various courtroom scenes of the last few chapters, we saw God challenging the idols to tell the future. And not once have they done it. The idols cannot do this. God is the author of history and no one else. And here he's emphasizing to his people again. I told you the former things and then I brought them about. I'm the one who's acting in history. I'm the one who's dealing with you. I'm the one who's brought the Babylonians to take you away. And I'm the one who's going to send Cyrus to bring you back again. I'm the author. I'm the agent in all of this. he's graciously shown his people what's going to happen to them in advance. But then in verse 6, you have heard. Look at all this. I've told you these things, you've heard them. And you, will you not declare it? He's like, are you not going to admit that this is true? Are you not going to recognize that because I've spoken the former things and then they've happened, that it's me acting? And it's as if God's saying, okay, if you're too proud to admit that I'm right, I'm going to do something different now. And this is an amazing turning point in verse 6 where he says, I proclaim to you new things from this time, even hidden things which you have not known. And verse 7 goes on, they are created now and not long ago. And before today you have not heard them, so that you will not say, behold, I knew them. You have not heard, you have not known. Even from long ago, your ear has not been open because I knew that you would deal very treacherously and you have been called a rebel from birth. birth. So God's saying, I'm going to go, we're going to go into new territory now. I'm going to tell you new things, um, something you've never heard me say before. And in verse 8 where he said, you know, you haven't known and you haven't heard. It's a kind of thought, it's a picture of Israel that we've come across a few times before, haven't we? As having ears they don't hear or having eyes they don't see. He's saying, look, that nothing's changed. You haven't changed at all. I've been telling you things you've not heard, you've not taken it in. Well, maybe you'll listen and pay attention now if I tell you something new. He's saying, because you were rebellious, I was hiding things from you before. But now I'm going to tell you. So what are these new things that God's going to tell his people? Well, it's things that with hindsight for us, we can easily see what they mean. But for the the people of Israel in Isaiah's time, God had never prophesied these things before. And it's to do with the Messiah. From this point on in the book of Isaiah, there's much greater emphasis on the first and second comings of Messiah and the future restoration of Israel. God's just opening up what the ministry of Messiah is going to be, who his servant is going to be. And there are even amazing promises about the very end of time, the new heavens and the new earth. These prophecies come right here in the Old Testament. They're not just reserved for the very end of the Bible. No, God always knew his plan. From the beginning of time, the end of the plan was made. But he'd never given these prophecies before the time of Isaiah. And so that's why they're new things. And much of these prophecies relate to our future too, not just the future of the Jews then. And he's saying, I haven't revealed these things to you before because you weren't the godly people I called you to be. And from the next few verses, you just get the sense that if the people had been more obedient, if they'd been more malleable, if they'd been softer toward God, he might have shown them the glorious future earlier on. But because they were hard, because they were stubborn, he wasn't ready to disclose his plans to them until now. But he says, when they come about, when these things happen, you will know it's not your idols. You won't be able to say, "Ah, I knew that. You know how like when someone tells you something completely new, but 
to them is very obvious and they've known it for ages and you kind of you don't want to appear a bit dumb or stupid it's easy to say I knew that all along but in actual fact you didn't well God's saying you can't say that to me because these things are so different so new there's no way you can pretend you knew what was coming So in verse 9, we go on. For the sake of my name, I delay my wrath. And for my praise, I restrain it for you in order not to cut you off. Behold, I've refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory, I will not give to another. So verse 9 is very clear. God is clearly saying it's for my sake, it's to protect my name that I've delayed my wrath. So what does that mean? I, I delayed for my own name's sake. It's showing that God always remembers mercy in his anger. So the anger of God was displayed when he allowed the um, people to go into exile and they suffered as slaves and they were conquered and they saw Jerusalem raised to the ground but he's saying I delayed that even though you were stubborn and rebellious for years I put that off for a long while and I've not destroyed you completely I won't cut you off completely for my name's sake and I think this is because of the way God has revealed himself and the way that God has chosen to identify himself. To Moses in the book of Exodus, God identified himself as the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And I think that was in Exodus chapter 3. And Isaiah has frequently referred to God as the Holy One of Israel. You see, God has connected himself to Israel in his very name. He names himself as the God of this people. So he could not allow this people to be cut off. He could not allow his people to be totally destroyed because that would give all the nations around about to get an excuse to say, oh, well, God must be weak. He can't even protect his own people. So that's why for his own name's sake, he does protect them. That's why for his own name's sake, he has such patience with his people. As he says, for my praise, I restrain it for you in order not to cut you off. And then he goes on in verse 10 to talk about a furnace. So he's refined his people in a furnace. Remember verse 4 was saying how they were like bronze and they were like iron. Well, these metals cannot be shaped. They cannot be um, bent or molded unless they're either white hot in the case of iron or actually molten in the case of bronze. You know, you try and bend or shape iron and bronze when they're cold and they will just break. But if you heat them up, then you can reshape them. And I feel that this picture of the furnace, God is saying, is because you were so hard, because you were like bronze and iron, I've had to put you through the furnace for you to come out different, for you to change, for you to be trained. So that's how this discipline is really a training ground for them. It's a way of humbling them, of softening their hearts so that they can then turn away from the idols and towards God. And he says in verse 11, I'm doing this for my own sake. For my own sake, he repeats it, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? He wants to bring his people back to him because he will not share his glory with idols. He won't stand for his people to go on worshipping any other gods, false gods that is. In the end, his greatest motivation is his own glory. And as the Jews went through exile and other trials, he was testing them. He was allowing them to go through these trials to train their hearts, to soften their pride and to turn them towards him. And as we become more surrendered ourselves and more godly, we bring greater glory to the Lord as well. So the chapter goes on with God's call to Israel and Andy's going to share from here on with you. That's great, thanks Joe. So we've got to verse 12. And in this Bible, the title is Deliverance Promised, or God's Call to Israel. We've put 
as a wee title here. Again, God commands his people to unblock their deaf ears. Let's read from verse 12 to 14. Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first. I am, the, I am also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He will carry out his good pleasure on Babylon, and his arm will be against the Chaldeans. So God is calling his people, Listen to me, O Jacob, verse 12. Even Israel whom I called. Um, I am he. And uh, again, we've looked at this before, haven't we? Um, very similar to what God has said before. Here we've got the covenant name of God. He's giving his credentials here. I am he. I am who I am. Just as he said to Moses in the uh, in the wilderness all those years before up on Mount Sinai. And I am the first and I am the last. And we said that God, um, God mentioned that in the previous chapter or the chapter before that. And it's the name of Jesus as well. Jesus, one of his titles in the book of Revelation, uh, 1 verse 17, he, Jesus said, I am the first and I am the last. And again, it gives us the, it helps us to see, gives us a little bit more evidence that Jesus is God. They've got the same name here. Jesus is God. And um, and and this is absolutely wonderful too. So God is call he, He's calling to His people. Listen to me. This is almost as if He's shaking them. Listen to me. I am who I am. I am the first and the last. Uh, you know, I I I'm you know the very beginning of time, the very end of time, right out of time. That's who I am. God is calling His people. And again, verse thirteen. We've seen this before, haven't we? Surely my hand founded the earth. God is declaring again again declaring his credentials he's saying right here i'm i'm the god that made everything i've i've made the earth i've founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens and th again this word heavens it doesn't mean the the spiritual heaven this means the universe it means the the you know the outer space it means all the stars all the moons everything god uh, and my right hand has spread out the heavens doesn't ne even need both of his hands just his right hand um uh, when i call to them they stand together isn't that absolutely amazing it's helping us to see that he's the god who holds the universe together as well his commands hold it all together absolutely amazing this is the god of creation and right the way through the bible it uh, the bible helps us to see it declares to us that um, he is the god of creation he created he made it there's no room for macro evolution um, and and i think we I hope we would all agree with that. Certainly Joe and I, th this is our standpoint in here. He is a God who makes it. He declares it. He said it. Do you believe it? Can we believe it? Yes, of course we can. And in verse 14, assemble all of you and listen. Again, going back to verse 12, listen to me. And verse 14 here, assemble all of you and listen. So he's calling to his remnant. He's calling to godly Jewish people. He's calling to all those that will listen to him, come and listen to him. Who among them has declared these things? Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He will carry out his good pleasure on Babylon and his arm will be against the Chaldeans. And God is saying, listen, let, let me remind you what I'm going to do here. And God has called this person, we know him as Cyrus, and he's called him to come and do a work for him. It's God that has done it. God has declared it. God, has, God is organizing the future, and he's raising up this man called Cyrus to deal with the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. It's the same word here, and to... Um, and, and and to fulfill God's plan. So as Joe said earlier on, God is saying it. Listen, I'm saying it. And uh, now that in the future, they're actually going to see that this is going to happen. And um, what I believe as well as we look at this, 
as we've said before, that that picture, remember that we've looked at before about the um the the range of mountains, and you've got six or seven or eight different mountains all sort of backing onto one another. And uh, Isaiah is there looking into the future. He he can't distinguish between them. He just sees the whole thing as one, just one range of mountains. And yet in history they go one after another after another after another. So here this is definitely a uh, um. A prophecy about Cyrus destroying the Babylonians and allowing the Jewish people to come out. But it goes deeper than that. Right here, God is beginning to declare those deeper things, the new things, the things that he's not disclosed before. And uh, what we'll find in the New Testament is that Babylon, or well, all really all the way through the Bible, and when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that Babylon is... It's like a code name. It's a picture for um, this great world empire. And, and in our day, it's a global empire. It's a new world order that I believe is rising up at the moment. I believe that we can feel the, um, the pressure. We can begin to feel um, that which is um, closing in uh, upon, upon the church, upon just human rights as well. Um, but in... in, in um, the day of uh, uh, Isaiah, he was looking to the actual Babylonian Empire, this great world empire which is being built up. And Cyrus was going to go. He was going to deliver the Jewish people from the Babylonian Empire. But in the end times, the great world empire um, rise up, the great global empire. And it's called Babylon in, in the book of Re Revelation. Uh, and we're going to read that scripture in just one moment. But then the Messiah comes to deliver his people from Babylon, from the world, and and we see a greater mountain behind the mountain of Cyrus delivering the people from Babylon. And we see that coming right the way through the Bible, in fact. And um, and let's look at verse fifteen. God says, "I even I have spoken. Indeed, I have called him. I have brought him, and he will make his ways." successful that it's God um he um he rose up Cyrus it was God's doing that he did it but also God is saying that he's going to do the same for Messiah at the end of time um uh, this great world empire the Messiah will come and deal with it verse 16 come near to me listen to this for the first I have not spoken in secret this is God saying from the time it took place, I was there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. And I feel very strongly that these last two lines are not speaking about Cyrus. It's going way beyond that. It's going right the way to the, uh, to, to the last mountain. And this is Messiah speaking. This is God speaking. Uh, and it, God is Messiah. Messiah is God. And the, the, the word of the Lord Jesus, the words of Jesus are coming out through this. And Jesus is saying, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. And uh, we think about Christmas, don't we, about the, the Lord Jesus coming. God sent his son into this world. But uh, the second coming as well, the Lord Jesus is going to come. God sends Jesus, again, the Messiah, to come and to deal with Babylon. Uh, absolutely wonderful, amazing um, scripture and picture that we have here. I want, uh, I want to look into the book of Revelation now, Revelation chapter 18 um, and the first four verses, Revelation chapter 18. And it says, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Again, that picture of um, the great the great world empire, the last great world empire, which is absolutely atheistic, um, absolutely anti-God, um, a way of controlling everyone. Um, and, and we see these things right in our day coming coming up, you know, the... Uh, um, ways of controlling people through um, 
through facial recognition, these things, and uh, many, many, many different ways of surveying, using surveillance for watching and controlling people, as well as microchipping people, which uh, will be something that will be happening in the near future too. Well, we, we see these things in the Bible, and here it's talking about the great world empire being destroyed, Babylon the Great being destroyed. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. In other words, the, all the nations have been part of it, in other words. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. All the merchants, all, the, uh, all, all those billionaires in um, Silicon Valley and all these places becoming rich off of um, you know, the pickings of uh, Babylon the Great. So uh, just su such a picture of destruction and uh, the Messiah is being sent to destroy. I'm going to come back to that in just one moment as well. So let's have a look at God's direction now from verse 17 to 19 of Isaiah chapter 49. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit who leads you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand and your offspring like grains. Their name would never have been cut off or destroyed from my presence. So the Lord teaches his people how to live in a way of blessing. God will lead and guide his people. Um, I am the Lord, your God, verse 17, who teaches you to profit, who will guide you and lead you in the right way, who leads you in the way that you should go. This is what God will do for his people, friends. We have found this in our lives, haven't we? He's a God that l loves to lead and guide us if we'll only listen to him, if we'll only listen to his word and obey and go in his direction. He's a God who will guide us. But in verse 18, you can feel the kind of pathos in this. You can feel the sadness in God's voice. If only you had paid attention to my commands. God is saying this to the Jewish people of his day. And um, God really says it into our lives as well, friends. All the blessings, if we'll only follow the way of the Lord, then your well-being would have been like a river, he's saying to the Jewish people. Your well-being, and, and that's the exact same word. It's the same Jewish or Hebrew word as peace. Then your peace will be like a river. And your righteousness like the waves of the sea. This was God's will for the Israelite people all the way along. They were to be a nation which spoke to all the other nations in the world of, of a blessed nation. Because they had a relationship with God. God was blessing them. They, had, they should have had great peace. They should have had great righteousness. They should have looked like a blessed nation. And yet... They were rebellious, most of them, most of the time. They were, they were the remnant that were godly people, that, but the re majority of them, they were standing against God. And God is saying, your, your, your descendants would have been like the sand of the seashore. This is what God said to, uh, um, to Abraham right the way back in the book of Genesis. We remember that, don't we? This was God's a word of blessing and prophecy for them and yet they, they were just dispersed so often um, and uh, that they didn't receive the blessing that they should have been living in um, and the preservation of the Lord peace like a river and righteousness like the ocean but verse 20 God says to his people, go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, declare with the sound of joyful shouting, proclaim this, send it out to the end of the earth, say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. There's going to come a day 
And there came a day when Cyrus gave the command, go forth from Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. And, and it was a time of great joy. And it was a time when God redeemed his people. And, um, you know, that picture that we have of redemption in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. Paul talks about it, that that, that idea of redemption, that, that, that God's people are like slaves all chained up to the slave master. But the uh, redeemer pays the price and the, the, the uh, slave is set free. And, and when, when, when Jesus has, has paid the price through his own blood, you and I can be set free from, from the chains to sin and death. Because we were under the wrath of God, we can be set free. And this, this call from God, come out of Babylon. It's a call to you and I, friends, come out of the world. Leave worldliness behind. God wants us to be led by him. Just as it says in verse 17, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, speaks to you and says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you. I am the Lord your God who wants to take you into profit, bless you. I want to show you the way to go. And yet, very often you wouldn't go. But God calls us, leave Babylon leave the world, leave the standards of the world behind and come and follow me. And it's a place of joy and it's a place of shouting. But you know, friends, at the end of time, that shout is going to go out to the Jewish people again and to all of us who are God's people. And we have this in Revelation 18, verse 4. Just, I read the first three verses earlier on about Babylon. And it says in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, come out of Babylon, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. Come out of her is exactly the same word uh, for the, the, that God gave through Isaiah here. Come out of Babylon. And a uh, and there's going to be a voice at the end, and I believe the Messiah is going to shout it, come out of Babylon, come out of the world. In that time of tribulation, in the time when the Antichrist is on the throne, he gives that great call to the Jewish people to come out of Babylon. But how? How can you come out of that place that's uh, so restrictive? You can't buy and sell without... Um, being part of uh, um, uh, b b being part of uh, that um, that scenario and that scene, God tells us how God will be able to uh, uh, help His people. And here we have it in verse nineteen of Isaiah forty nine. Your descendants would have been like sorry in uh, verse twenty one. I beg your pardon. Let me read verse 21 to 22. That will get this back in order. Go forth from Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans. Declare with the sound of joyful shouting. Proclaim this. Send it out to the end of the earth. Say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made the water flow out of the rock for them. He split the rock and the water gushed forth. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. So going back to verse 20, go forth from Babylon. Or, and the, going back to uh, the book of Revelation, the word for the Messiah is get out of, get out of her. Get out of Babylon. But as I said, if, if, if we come out of that, uh, uh, that, that, that world power that controls everything, that you can't buy anything unless you are part of it. How can you come out and survive? And yet God is promising here from verse 21. Don't you remember when God took the uh, children of Israel out of Egypt, which was the Babylon of its day, the world empire of its day, when the slaves were taken out of uh, Egypt? God looked after them. Miraculously, God saw that, he, that their needs would be provided. The water flowed from the rock. And God is saying, I'm going to do it again. When, uh, when you come out of the world, when you come out of Babylon at the end times, I'm going to do it again. I will miraculously look after my people. 
And then in verse 22, it says, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. In other words, those who stay in Babylon, those who stay in the world, those who will not come out of Babylon, those who will not compromise those who will compromise and won't come out so many of the jewish people they wouldn't come out and um and and they're seen as wicked because they're not re- they're not responding to the word of the lord in the end so friends l- let let's be those who 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 hear the word of the lord in all these things and let's come out of the world let's not compromise with the world in any way Uh, Let's not be like the rebellious Jewish people. Let's be those who are the remnant and respond when God speaks. Let's not get, excuse me, sucked into Babylon without uh, that, that, that world power, without any reference to God, come out of it. Even though it might seem like madness, trust in the Lord and he's going to see us through with miracles. I have no doubt about that. Let's trust him. Trust him in these days, friends. And this is the word of the Lord.